open up this morning to page 146. Page 146 is where we're going to start. That's day five of, uh, of lesson, uh, lesson six. And today, Lord willing, we'll wrap this up. But if not, that's okay, too. If it takes us a little bit of time for some discussion, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. But we're going to, Lord willing, we'll get into lesson seven, which has a new memory verse. Now, I have been quoting this. Uh, about every week since we started this study, it's Galatians 5.16. You probably know it uh, because it's, it's a short little one and a tremendous promise. So let's say at the reference, then the verse, and then the reference again. Galatians 5.16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5.16. Would, would you say that's a promise? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. It, it doesn't say walk in the Spirit. Most of the time you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh, right? It's, it's if you're doing this, if you're, if you're in the basket, you won't be pulled down by gravity, right? Because you're in the, you're in the hot air balloon, right? If you, if you step out, well, then, then you're, going to be, you're going to be affected by all of the laws that you were before. Today we're going to wrap up, as I said, Lord willing, Lesson 6. We're looking at the foundation for surrender, which is counting God trustworthy and surrendering to his will. And in talking about surrender, we may quietly ask within ourselves, why should I surrender? I, I'm doing okay. I, I, I can run things decently effectively. So why, why should I surrender my, my, my autonomy my, my sovereignty, why should I surrender it to God? Well, we surrender because we know that what I just said isn't true. When, when we say, well, I'm doing okay. No, you're not, and you know it. And if you're honest, you, you'd admit, no, you, you don't do well living the Christian life by yourself, and neither do I. And the reason that you don't do well is because you're not supposed to. God didn't design the Christian life so that it can be lived in the power of the flesh. He designed it so that it can only be lived effectively and victoriously in the power of the Spirit. And so why should you surrender your life? Why should I surrender my life? Because that's the only way that it works. That's the only way that I'm going to be able to have victory. And if I'm honest, I'll admit it, it's really not working out that well. My, my sovereignty, my autonomy as a person making all of my own decisions and doing whatever I want is a, is a guaranteed prescription for disaster. And we've all experienced that. We need to surrender to Christ not only for that reason, but we need to surrender to Christ because only Christ is acceptable in the eyes of God. We looked at this last week right at the end. What did God say when Jesus came up out of the water standing next to John the Baptist in the Jordan River? Do you remember? My beloved son, who am I well this, is, with? this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And, and then again on the Mount of Transfiguration, that voice was heard. So does God say that about Ben Linville in the flesh? No, not in the flesh, but when I surrender my life to Christ and I allow the life of Christ to be lived out through me, then it can also be said of me that, that I'm well, God can look at Ben Linville and say, I'm well pleased. Why? Because, because I just see Christ. Because Christ is living in him. And that is one, another reason why we should surrender it's only as we present our bodies as living sacrifices to allow Christ to live his life through us that we can have victory. A quote on page 144, it says, In and of ourselves we will never be holy and acceptable to God. This is why we must deny self and yield to God. Our acceptance comes from Christ and the transforming power of the gospel. There's nothing in and of myself that's acceptable to God. Just as I depend on Christ alone for justification, now I need to depend on, depend on Christ alone for sanctification. It's very, very important. So we come to day five, and uh, we're on page 146, and we'll start with question one. 
Do you ever feel that there are things in your life that you know are wrong, but you can't seem to change them? Now, I'm not asking you to tell me what it is, but have you ever felt that way? Oh, boy. man, yeah, I, I have. We've all felt that way. You feel kind of this, this weird cycle that you get stuck in. And you, you've experienced it, I've experienced it, where maybe you come away from church or you come away from you know, being in God's word or a message that you heard online or on the radio or something, and you think, man, got to do it. This is it. This is the time. It's going to work this time. And you go out and things are going well, and then all of a sudden it seems like the whole ship just falls apart at once. And you realize, well, that didn't, that didn't work out how I was expecting it to. I thought this was going to be it. We've all had this happen. But 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, another tremendous promise, says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. What's that, what does that mean, real quick? All the temptations have been here before. It means when you're feeling and when you're tempted to say, I'm the only one who's ever felt this way. What, what does the Bible say? Well, the Bible says in, in Ecclesiastes, there is how many new things under the sun? None. There's nothing new under the sun. First Corinthians says, there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to men. Now, it may be unique to your particular situation because you are a unique individual, but you're not the first person to struggle with your thoughts. You're not the first person to struggle with, with whatever that, that sin is. You're not the first person to struggle with it. So there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to men, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye, ye may be able to bear it. So this is another truth. This God very obviously is, is making this as a, a promise. This is a statement of fact. And so it's something that I need to reckon upon. I need to count it as fact in my life. So when I face the temptation and my mentality would say, there is no way that I cannot sin in this situation. This is, I, I, I have to do wrong here. The Bible says, no, you don't have to do wrong because God will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. So God always provides us the power to resist temptation. That's a fact. Okay, And I, I had a, a youth pastor, I think I mentioned it, I had a youth pastor years ago who explained it this way. He said, when you're flying down the highway towards sin, you're on the road of temptation and the destination is sin, God will always put an exit ramp. Always. Now, sometimes we miss an exit ramp. So what, what, what does God often do? He puts another one. And another one, and then a big sign that says road out. And we have all of these warnings. Hey, don't do that. And we say, no, I got to do this. And we keep buzzing on towards sin, but we don't have to. God provides a way to escape. If we, if we submit to God and resist the devil, he will flee from us. Right? So we have that as a promise. So we have this fact that's here in Scripture. But, but what about when I don't feel like this is because that's where we live. We, we can sit here, and, and as I've said before, it's easy to do right when we're sitting here in, in this company. But what about when I don't feel like it? Well, on page 146, he says, In the exchange with Christ, you were given the power of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, but not necessarily the feeling of that power. U underline that. And then double underline the next statement. Your feelings are not a reliable source of truth. Your feelings will lie to you consistently. You, you know what it takes to change your feelings? Well, eat something wrong. <laughs> have a bad night's sleep. Get a fee you ever have a fever dream? Boy, that, that'll change your feelings in an awful hurry. When you get a real high fever and you start to hallucinate, oh, that's, that's rough. <laughs> it doesn't take much to change feelings. Feelings are not a reliable source of truth. A lot of times people say, well, I just don't feel like his grace is sufficient. Is his grace sufficient? 
Well, he said it is. He, he says there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. And I'm faithful, and I won't suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. But in the in the heat of the moment and in the in the pressure of the temptation, you feel like, oh, there's no escape. There, there is, and my feelings are not a reliable source of information. An illustration that he uses here in the book is, is of Mr. Fact, Mr. Faith, and Mr. Feeling. I, I, he got this from a book by Watchman Nee called The Normal Christian Life. If you've ever read it, I would highly recommend it. The first seven chapters of that book are life transforming. Uh, but this is an illustration that I believe he borrowed from them. We talk about Mr. Fact, Mr. Faith, and Mr. Feeling. And you have three men, and they're walking along the top of a narrow wall. Okay, so I'm adding a little bit here uh, to, to his illustration. As long as, now, now and they, they're in this order, okay? You have Mr. Fact, Mr. Faith, and Mr. Feeling. That's important. That, they're in that order. As long as Mr. Faith keeps his eyes on Mr. Fact, then, then they'll stay on the wall and feeling may get behind a little bit, but it'll catch up eventually. Okay? That's, that's important to have it in this order. So, and this is, this is how we should live. What would be, if you had to, to point to an object in which you can put faith, what would, what would, you, what would you point to? to? A chair, well, a, a chair on this earth, but to Christ. A chair, yeah, that's, that's good. How, how, how about the revelation of God to men through his word. You want to, you want to put faith in something. This is our source of facts. Okay? So I'm looking for facts and I have my eyes on facts. And and the facts may may say this is where we're going to go and feeling is in the back and he's screaming. And he's crying because he doesn't feel like this is the right way to go. So I'm going to keep my eyes Mr. Mr. Faith needs to keep his eyes on Mr. Fact or something bad's going to happen. But here's what often happens. We're walking down the wall, and Mr. Fact is, he's, he's good. He doesn't fall. He stays on the wall. But Mr. Faith gets sick of looking at Mr. Fact, and Mr. Feeling is, he's raising such a ruckus that, that Mr. Faith looks back, and he, he focuses on Mr. Feelings. What, what's going to happen as he's walking along the wall like this? Bad things are going to happen. Why? Because Mr. Feeling, what will happen to Mr. Fact? They'll stay on the wall. Because <laughs> facts don't change. Facts stay there. But when your faith gets tied up in your feelings, you're, you're headed for disaster. You say, I don't, I don't feel saved. Well, well let's, let's, go to, let's go to facts. Have you placed your faith in Christ alone? Yeah. Well, are you depending on your works? Or are you depending just on Christ? Well, I'm depending just on Christ. Well, then what does the Bible say? It says, it says I'm saved. Oh, but I don't feel that way because I'm, I'm really struggling right now. We, we must keep the proper order. When we have Mr. Faith looking at Mr. Feeling, bad things are going to happen. And this isn't just about assurance of salvation. When we have the feeling, I don't feel like I can get victory over this. Well, the Bible says that you can have victory. The Bible says that Christ always causes us to triumph. If I'm looking in the right direction, then I'll, I'll walk on the right path. Fact, then faith, then feeling. And feeling can get behind. Feeling can do what it wants, and it usually does. But if I keep my faith in the facts, eventually feeling will catch up, usually. But if it doesn't, we still have to maintain that. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 says, And he said unto me, this is Paul talking to God about his, his thorn in the flesh. We've looked at this passage extensively. And he said unto me, My grace, what's the next word? Sufficient. Is. It is. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. It is a fact that must be accepted, it must be reckoned, and then we must step out trusting God's strength to indeed be sufficient. God's grace is sufficient. So you don't know my situation. No, 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 no. It, your, your situation, my situation, both of our bad situations combined, His grace is sufficient because God is that big. 
God is that powerful. God is that strong. God is that amazing. On page 148, he says, When we received Christ, we became God's children. He is now responsible for us. As a good father, he is constantly at work in our lives. We do not influence whether he spends his energies on us. Okay? That, that's, that's worthy of note. But we do determine what kind of energy he aims at us. Okay? Fathers pay attention to their children. Uh, the child's behavior is going to dictate the type of attention that they receive. <coughs> Proverbs 3, verse 34. Surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace unto the lowly. So if I want God's positive attention, scorn is probably not the way to get that. He's going to, he's going to return in kind if I, if I do that. James chapter 4, verse 6. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he said, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. humble. So if I want God's positive attention in my life, I should be humble. humble. And if I, if I want to, to, to test my mettle with almighty God, I can, I can be proud. And it won't go well. It won't go well because God resisteth the proud. God, there is an adversarial relationship between Almighty God and a proud being. Be that Satan in the very beginning, or be that me standing in my home here in Wayland, God resists the proud. Again, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, Be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Yes, sir? When you, uh, you go to work, or when you're working with the kids, and you're telling them this, you want to have pride in your work and, and have pride in the way you dress and have pride in the way, in the way you talk and here it says resist the proud and be humble so uh, it's a different kind of pride <laughs> yeah we could even use another word do all things with excellence because he's worthy why should you do your best in math class well I don't like math class I, I speak from this is a personal testimony to you. Uh, I, why, why should I do good? Well, I should do what I do. I should do it heartily as unto the Lord and not as men because it's from the Lord that I'll receive the reward. Why, why should you give your best at work? Well, because I'm proud. No, no, because I serve, I serve a higher authority than the boss who signs my paycheck. I, I serve the Almighty, and so I'm going to do my best. I'm going to do my best in whatever I do. And, and so pride, when we say, I'm proud, of, I'm proud of my daughter, well, if, if it's truly an a, a ego thing for me, and I'm, whew, my daughter is where it is at. No, nope, I'm, I'm stepping out on dangerous ground. But if I can say, boy, what she did, she did well. And that's a good thing. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to do everything that I can to train her to always do her very best in every situation because that's what pleases God. Yeah, that's kind that's of right. Kind yeah. Of, yeah. yeah. Definitely. Right. Excellence. Yes, sir. In a lot of situations, I heard a guy talk about this one time. <clears throat> in a lot of situations, you can use the word thankful because it's all from God. No matter what how, what you did or the God who did, yeah. it comes from God, and you, you can be thankful for what you come from your daughter. Yeah. And her abilities is from God. Yeah. So a lot of situations you can use the word thankful instead of proud. Yeah. Ultimately, it comes down not so much to the vocabulary we use as to the state of our heart. If, if, if you have pride, you could call it thankfulness. And you say, no, I'm not proud. I'm thankful. I'm amazing. And I'm thankful for it. <laughs> no, no, no. That, you're, you're off. You say, I'm not proud. But, but if you go the other way, you say, my daughter did a good job, and I'm thankful that God gave her the ability to do that. Yeah, it's, but it's all a matter. You can say one word and be the other in both directions. You can say thankful and be proud, or you can say proud and be thankful, but make sure that the heart is where it should be. That's, that's what's most important. Yeah. He actually says here on page 149, pride is living as if we know better than God, and it keeps us from his grace. When, when I think, well, Lord, I'm here on the ground, and I know what's best. Uh, no, 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 because, see, the, the neat thing is that God is outside of time, space, and matter, and God sees the end from the beginning. God sees the future and knows the future better than I can remember the past. 
And so for me to say, Lord, you can sit this one out because I understand what needs to happen and I'm going to take the appropriate steps. Ooh, don't do that. Yes, sir. Pride goeth before a fall. Absolutely. And, and God has a knack for putting down the proud, and often publicly. It's not wise to, to allow pride to come. Pride would have me keep attempting to live the Christian life in my power when God is offering me his grace and his power. It, so it would be foolish for me to say, I, I got this. I, I am an exceptionally disciplined individual, at least in this area, and I can do it. No, God says, no, no, my strength is sufficient for you because my, my, my strength is made perfect in weakness. When I realize, Lord, I'm, I'm not strong enough. I don't have what it takes to do what you want the way you want it done. But, Lord, I'm available, so I present my body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you. And, Lord, you use my members to accomplish your will and to give me victory. That's what God's looking for. God is looking for that, uh, that level of surrender. But I won't do that until I realize the futility of trying to do it myself and, and the trustworthiness of God. God is absolutely trustworthy in all of these things. So we come here to lesson 7 on page 155, the filling of the Spirit, experiencing the realities of God's grace. He gives an illustration on page 155 that reminds us of the story of Isaac in Genesis 26. Abraham during his his life had gone around because they were nomadic peoples, they were shepherds. So they would go with their flocks and their herds to one particular area. And when they got there, they would need to, because they were in a, a semi-desert environment, they would dig wells. And so that was very common. They would dig wells, and then they would be able to water their flocks and their herds. Well, Abraham has passed off the scene. Now Isaac is the, is the patriarch. And uh, Isaac returns to one of those areas, and he discovers that an enemy had come and had filled in the wells with stones and dirt. Why would the enemy do that? Well, it prevents other people from coming onto your territory. In need of water, he and his servants begin removing the stones, and they discover that one of the wells was actually a spring. It was a spring-fed well. It wasn't just tapping into a, a table of water, but it was there was some there was some life there in the water. They had not been able to access the life-giving water, though, because of the stones that were placed over it. On page 155, he says, We are prone to allow the rocks of sin and self to block the fountain of living water God placed in us at salvation. Your surrender to Jesus Christ is not a one-time act that makes you spiritual from that point on. Wouldn't that be neat? If you could say, Lord, from henceforth and forever, I am yours, do with me as you please, and then we don't struggle with sin anymore. Wouldn't that be awesome? That'd be really awesome, but that's not how it is. It's not a one-time, Lord, I'm yours, and now I don't struggle. To maintain the life-giving flow of God's Spirit, you must refuse to allow the desires of the flesh to lodge in your heart. And instead, stay committed to listening and surrendering to the voice of the Holy Spirit. The Bible calls this the Spirit-filled life. Something that he mentions here. He says you must refuse to allow the desires of the flesh to lodge in your heart. I don't remember who it was who it was a, an evangelist of years gone by who said you can't you can't prevent a bird from flying over your head, but you can surely prevent them from building a nest in your hair. Okay? That's true. That's what we're talking about here. You can't prevent, you will face the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. If you live a normal life, you're going to encounter the world, the flesh and the devil. It's out there. But, but when we allow things to take root, when we allow the birds to start bringing twigs and, and weaving them into our hair, we're, we're, we're stepping out of, of, of where God can bless us because we're making provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. When I, when I allow myself to harbor these things and I, and I think, well, you know, they're not that bad. These thoughts aren't that bad. No, they are that bad. They hung Christ on the cross, and I need to have that perspective on them. 
day one on page 50, 156. In John 14, Jesus promised to send the Comforter, speaking of the, the Holy Spirit. John 14, verse 16 says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another Comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth in you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Question B on page 156. Why can't an unbeliever have the Holy Spirit dwell in him or her? Hasn't According accepted. to Scripture. Hasn't accepted. Hasn't accepted Christ. Yeah. Have Christ in their own because, because the world doesn't get the Spirit of, of God. The, the, that's, that is for children, right? The Bible talks about our inheritance, right? Our inheritance is the Spirit of God. He's the earnest of our inheritance. Why doesn't everyone get uh, what is left to you when an ancestor passes away? Well, because they're not family. Okay? Why don't the lost get the Spirit of God? Because they're not family. Yeah, this is for the family of God. They, the, the Spirit of God is the earnest of our inheritance. Question C on page 156. How did, how did you come to know the Holy Spirit? Scripture, I think it's in 1 Corinthians, that it's no one can say that Jesus Christ is Lord without the help of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah. To acknowledge the Lordship of Christ, absolutely. Yeah. Look at verse 17. He says that we can know that we have the Spirit because He dwelleth in you, yeah. shall be in you. We sing the song, especially around Easter. You ask me how I know He lives, He lives. <laughs> In my heart. How, how can I know that I have the Spirit of God? Well, He, he lives in me. And, and so I, I, I feel that, I, I can feel that presence. And even when I can't feel that presence, I have God's Word on it. To, to keep things in order, to keep faith pointed at fact, not feeling, I know because the Bible says so. On page 156, he says, The word translated another, here in John 17, where we're looking, the word translated another implies one just like me. That, that's what that word is. It's the word halos. The word comforter means one who calls us alongside. So Jesus promised to send someone just like him to walk through life with us. Isn't that neat? That's an amen. That's, that is certainly an amen. I have often thought about, about what happened with the disciples when Jesus went up to heaven because because they knew Jesus right they knew who Jesus they knew Jesus in a way that we know Jesus in in all of his word but they knew Jesus like they knew what Jesus liked to eat they knew that Jesus he he likes this particular color they knew Jesus the way that we know our our human friends and so Jesus goes up to heaven and can you imagine the heartbreak when they say, oh, I miss, I miss Jesus. I miss, he's, he's my friend, Peter and James and John. They say, he's, Jesus, he was my friend and now he's gone. Well, and then, then when Jesus sends his spirit down and, and those same disciples who had walked with Jesus are now indwelt by Jesus. Imagine for a second just, just how special that is. Just how neat that would be. That that feeling of loneliness is no longer is no longer there. Well, Jesus, try, try telling Peter that Jesus isn't here. He'd say, Oh no, he's he's here. He lives, he lives in me. I know him. I knew him when he was here in in body, and I know that he's here now in spirit because he said he would. And he lives inside of me. That's a pretty amazing, amazing truth that we have. But this, this principle that he'll send a comforter, one who's like him, to walk through life with us. And, and he'll lead us in the right direction. Question number two, page 157. Now that you have the Holy Spirit, where does he live? 
He lives inside of you. He lives in my life. In my life. In my life. I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you a, a hint. The body to the temple of God. Yes. So he lives. He he lives in in my members is the way that we've said it prior to this. He lives. The Holy Spirit of God has taken up residence in the body that stands before you. That's that's an amazing truth. Question. Yeah. Uh, explain this. Maybe somebody some people have this question. Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit came down. The day of Pentecost, and uh, so who, who was the indwelling? What, what was the situation for the Old Testament folk before the Holy Spirit came? The day of Pentecost, and you know, was it, he still do they still say it the same way? Yeah, yeah. by grace through faith. Yeah. Yes. And, so uh, let's. To, so those, those folks back there, there's millions and millions of people that lived prior to the day of Pentecost. Absolutely. And so let's let's say right here is is. Pentecost, okay, right? The, the pulpit divides. So this is Old Testament, and this over here is New Testament. When did the Holy Spirit come into being? On the it's a trick Pentecost. question. When did the Holy Spirit come into existence? Always has been. Always has been. Right, because the Holy Spirit is God. And how long has God been around? Yep, he's been around. Uh, and has always been around God. God predates time. Yeah, so, Which that sentence doesn't even make sense, does it? Okay? God has always been. Okay? So the Holy Spirit did exist in the, in the very beginning. Okay? And so what, what does the Bible mean when it says that Samson had the Spirit of God come upon him? Well, in the Old Testament, from the beginning, which would be with Adam, up until the time of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon men as an empowering force. And usually you can tell because they do something amazing. For instance, Samson has it said more of him than anyone else in the Old Testament that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he killed a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he ripped a lion in half from the back legs up. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he pushed the pillars of the temple apart. All of those are deeds that are not possible for man to do in and of himself. So the Holy Spirit, up and from the time of Adam till the time of Pentecost, is an empowering presence. Then you come to Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit descends on the day of Pentecost. And now, from the day of Pentecost until, until the rapture, the Holy Spirit comes as an indwelling presence. Mm. So we have an empowering presence, same Spirit of God, same other, uh, same amazing power, but now I have... Think about it. I have the Spirit of God that allowed Samson to push the pillars apart. I have that Spirit of God now living inside of me. According to this verse, my body is his temple. And so he lives within, within my body, and he wants to use my members to accomplish victory in my life. Is the Spirit of God all about Having us rip lions in half in this day and age. No, don't try it. Okay? Okay? Because the Bible says don't test God. Okay? And he might just let the lion eat you. Okay? So, but the Spirit of God, the same Spirit of God that enabled great service in that day, indwells for victory and service in ours. So the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, empowering versus indwelling. And that's that's the difference. Yes, sir. And then another question comes to my mind. What what does Pentecost mean? Pentecost means 50. Pentecost means 50 days after. Okay. 50 day, Pentecost is celebrated every year by the Jews. It's day 50, 50. 50 days after the, the Day of Atonement. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it, it rotates okay. every year. Yep. Okay. Yep. From the blue box here on page 157, sometimes I give you some of these questions. They're, they're good, for, good for spurring thought. The Holy Spirit is making a difference in your life. One of the things new believers face right away is being convicted over things that never bothered them in the past. Okay? This is true. Okay? You will probably feel more sinful now that you have the indwelling Holy Spirit than you did before you were saved. You might even mistake the increase of conviction as a sign that you're not saved. Okay, Now, I, I'm aware of my audience here this morning, and I've talked to, to most of you in here, and I know your testimonies of having trusted Christ. 
So let's let's pull that. It's a good question for you and me to answer, and it's a good truth for you and I to acknowledge. This is a fact. Many times when somebody trusts the Lord, now you've got the Holy Spirit, and, and something, you say, well, I always do that. And the Holy Spirit says, you shouldn't. Oh, <laughs> well, now we've now we got to change things up. But how can you and I, as we have opportunity to help those who have recently trusted Christ, how do we deal with this? Because I've dealt with this, and maybe you have too. Somebody who comes, they say, I, yeah, I, I did ask Jesus into my heart. I'm trusting him. But I, I'm so aware of my sinfulness. Because now you have the Holy Spirit living inside. And the Holy Spirit is, is to convict men of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And that's, that's for the unsaved, certainly. But also for the believers. Okay, So what, what I used to do, now I, I, I just don't feel right doing that. I always thought it was okay because it's just it's what I did, it's what my dad did, it's what my what his dad did, and I've always done that. But now I just don't feel right about it. What should you do when somebody comes? Yes, sir. the word of sanctification. God's begin to make you holy or make you up most more like Himself. Absolutely, that is what it is. The moment of justification. So now sanctification. God's gonna, as I've mentioned it, as He's gonna knock off all of the parts of you that don't look like Jesus. Does that feel good all the time? No. No, sometimes it hurts. So, so how do you deal with somebody who comes and they ask you? You can. You say, absolutely. It's, it is part of sanctification. Here's, here's one thing real quickly that you don't do. Okay, Don't say to that person, well, don't worry about that. We all struggle with that. No. no. Don't, don't minimize the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. If anything, magnify the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. When somebody trusts Christ and they have that that super sensitivity to sin. Is that a bad thing? No, no. no we could all not. do with a little touch of that, couldn't we? Wouldn't it be great if sin just really upset us? If think, think of how much more we would be aware of in our life if sin, it just bothered us. And I've talked to, to new believers, and, and they said, I just can't, I can't tolerate the break room at my job anymore. It's terrible, and the, the jokes that are told, the things that are said, I just can't handle it anymore. And, and a week ago, they were in there, and they weren't just laughing, they were saying the things. And now it just, it just runs all over them. Don't say to that person, well, you, you'll get used to it. No, don't, don't minimize the work of the Spirit. Encourage them to follow the dictates of the Spirit and, and to, to walk in the Spirit. To, for them to, if the Spirit of God says to, to you, we're talking to a new believer here. Hey, if the Spirit of God is, in, is, is leading you to eat lunch in your truck instead of in the break room, then get out in the truck. Not a problem. Now, will that person, may that person grow in maturity, not to the point where it doesn't bother them anymore, but may, might they grow to the point where they say, I want to have an impact on so-and-so, and he's in the break room. So I'm going in not as a participant. I'm going in to reach that person. Absolutely. That's a good thing. Don't, don't minimize the work of the Spirit of God. Help that person along. Use, use the, the sensitivity that they have for them to, to walk in victory. If, if the Spirit of God says, you shouldn't do that, then don't. And, and if the Spirit of God says, don't, don't listen to that, then turn it off. He said, don't watch that, turn it off. He says, he says don't say that, then hush. Walk, walk in the Spirit, and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Very, very important for us to, as we have opportunity, to talk with those who have just trusted Christ, to, to work with them on this. To, to say, well, hey, you know, maybe that's just the sin that so easily besets you, brother. You'll have to get used to it. It's going to be a long, a long walk all the way home. <laughs> don't, don't, don't do that. Don't discourage somebody. Encourage them. Say, hey, no. If, if the Lord is, if the Lord's leading you to step away from such and such, then step away from such and such, and and make sure that you're obeying the dictates of the Spirit. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Sometimes, um, it, it, it's a lot easier if 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 the people over there are people that you you know them, but you're not. I think the problem with most Christians is, is that, especially new Christians, is that the people that 
we love a lot of times are the ones that pick on us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's a, a little harder to to uh, to deal with. But I'm I'm trying to think of that. There's this very special. It's been running through my brain all week, and it, I don't know if it's a scripture or a song, but I think it's a scripture first that talks about climbing every mountain that God will help us to be able to get out of the out of the ditches. Yeah. And move up into the into the higher plane. Yeah. Um, and we can't do that by ourselves. Yeah. But he has promised help. Yes. I'm gonna I'm gonna we're 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 closing down Sunday school here, but I'm gonna open Pandora's box as we do. So so I'll get I'll get everything started here. It's it's real easy when you're talking with a new believer and their their spirit is touched, they're super sensitive to the sin of lost people. That's that's easy. Here's here's when it gets more difficult. When that new believer says, "But so and so who is saved, they knew it." Yeah. That's that's when we run into what what we have taught. We have gone into this extensively. That's when we talk about Christian liberty. And that's when the apostle Paul said, "I will eat no meat while the world standeth if it causes my brother to offend." That's when we have to say, look, I'm going to allow my, my Christian liberties to be, to, be, to be withheld in order to not offend this, this new convert. I'm not going, I know there's nothing wrong with, and I'll use the biblical example, I know there's nothing wrong with eating that meat, but it really bothers so-and-so because they were saved out of idolatry. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not going to eat the meat when I'm around so-and-so because it'll bother them. And so, as I said, I open Pandora's box, and then I'm going to walk away from it. But that will give you something to think about as you go about. If you have more questions on that, I would encourage you. Read 1 Corinthians, because that's where we find out an awful lot about Christian liberties. Well, let's bow for a word of prayer, and we will continue on here this morning. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your love. And we thank you for the Spirit of God who lives within us. Thank you for the guiding the guiding power that he has in our life. Lord, I pray that we, even those of us who've been saved uh, for, for a good long time, Lord, that we would still be sensitive to the, to the leading of the Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would help us to walk in the Spirit and that we would live in victory and not fulfill the lust of the flesh, that we would realize in every instance that your grace is sufficient and, Lord, that you're not going to lead us into anything that, uh, that we cannot handle through your power. Pray that you help us understand this, walk in these truths. Be with us now as we prepare for the for the, the next service in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.